Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Bree Noble. I am ex- so excited to be here with my friend Latoya Cooper from Music Meets the Boardroom, which I, gosh, I love that name. That name is just like all about my heart <laughs> as far as like business and music combined. So we're going to get into, uh, you know, why she started Music Meets the Boardroom, her background, and who she is missioned to help in the music industry and then a a really cool conference that she's doing coming up that I'll tell you about in a bit. So let's dive in. Let's start out. Latoya, just I would love to know a little bit about your background. Obviously, you are also a musician. You're very knowledgeable and have a ton of experience and Um, you know, even the academic background in business, but you're also a singer songwriter. So just let us know a little bit about your journey and how you kind of merge those two loves in your life. Absolutely. First and foremost, thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. I'm so honored and grateful and excited to share information with all the listeners. I came out the wound singing. I love music. I love arts and what I find so fascinating about it is you, you fall in love with it before you really understand it. You know what I mean? That, that beautiful gift. And so um, I have been performing for years, um, performing for the governor growing up. I won top talent at Miss Oklahoma at 18 years old. I mean, I was on a path and around 19, 18, 19 years old, um, my parents were like, hey, we love your singing. You're doing great. You're making a name for yourself. You're like a local you know, celebrity around here. But you know what? You're going to college and you're going to go get that nine to five. So, <laughs> you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, you really don't have a choice in some aspects. So I said, OK, you know, your parents know best. So I, I went and got that nine to five and um, or got went to college and I found myself after one degree. I was like, I was, I'm not happy. I don't know what's wrong. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Right. So I went back for another degree. Yep. I did that. Then I went back for another one. I was searching for that. Uh, American academics. Yes. I know some people like that. (laughs) My husband has a doctorate, so I totally get that. Oh, oh yeah. He never stopped learning and (laughs) I'm the same way, but I was searching for, you know, what I was told you're supposed to find through that experience and with, you know, life you learn that that's not really the case for, you know, depending on the situation in your own personal journey. And God brought me back to music because I had been suffering from depression for 10 years because I had let go of that part of me that was really a, the way I spiritually connected. And I didn't know that. Hmm. And so um, in my, I think, how old was I? I may have been like in my early thirties and I started singing again. God told me just sing again. And I was like, okay, I don't know where this is going, but okay. And what I learned in that process was it wasn't about, you know, this is your opportunity to be a star per se, or or what have you as an artist. It was more of, I need you to learn something from music for the next phase of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, once I got that, um, it's a long story. I had peace around kind of letting go of some things because I realized that um, I had been, my life was evolving into something else where I am today, where um, I'm still holding a microphone, but I'm actually speaking more than I'm singing. But I love singing. And I, and I love the fact that I have the understanding and that love for the arts and I can advocate for the um, for the community, the music community, because I understand both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, I'm in such a similar place. Like I am 
or at least especially for the past seven years, like I've been doing a lot more, you know, teaching and like you said, holding the microphone or writing books or whatever uh, on the educational side for musicians. But like, I'm still a musician at heart. And like now as of March, I am now working as a music director at a church again, which is a little crazy to balance with what I do here. Cause I'm not doing any less on this side, but like <laughs> it is feeding my soul, you know, to really get right. back into music. And I think that, you know, it's important what you said about how you, you reignited your music in your thirties and you needed that to like come back to your true self. And I think we all need that because otherwise either like music becomes a grind because it's, it's always like, you know, chasing the, how can we, how can we make money from this thing? Right. Or like we abandon it. And then finally we realize, okay, there are two parts of us. There's the creative part and there's the, you know, the, the thing that needs to pay the bills or whatever. And sometimes we can merge those and sometimes we can't, but like our soul needs that artistic thing. I know for me, when I tried to, <laughs> when I had my first daughter and I was like, okay, this is what I do now. I'm a mom. And it lasted mm. for about six weeks. I was like, tried to give up music <laughs> and it didn't really stick. Yes. It's how it's part of how we survive. You know, we need yep. that to survive. And what I learned in, in my case was that I didn't have to have music in a certain way or the arts in a certain way. I just needed to touch it in some form or fashion. And it still fulfilled me. And so um, that's where I am. I am now. No, I saw, you know, someone asked you a question on TikTok and you were answering about like, how do you know when it's time to like leave that nine to five and like pursue that thing that you feel like is tugging at you as an entrepreneur, whether it's in music or not. And I know that you kind of went through that. How did you know that it was time to, to do that? You know, what's so crazy. I had been preparing and did not even know it. I had been building bands I had or managing bands uh, in in Dallas and in New York. I had been performing in different parts of the country and in overseas. I had been um, writing music, releasing music, working on the legal aspect, paperwork, all this stuff, um, not only for myself, but for other people as well, education and just building that brand and experience. But I didn't realize that all that experience that I was building was actually the, the launching pad to actually jump. And I didn't know it until the moment I got clarity that was like, hey, it's time to go. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what am I supposed to do? How am I going to make money? All this stuff. And then I had a moment of clarity. I was like, oh, I've already been preparing for this and didn't know it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I had such a similar thing with like starting women of substance and building up this list of female indie artists. And when it was finally like uh, my daughter went, started going to kindergarten, my second daughter, and I was like, okay, I got to like really like buckle down and like either go back and get a job or like do something else. And I was like, I interviewed for jobs. And then I was like, I found myself like hoping that I wouldn't get the job because I realized I didn't want to work anymore in the mainstream and in corporate. And I was like, oh, like I've already been building this group of people under the women of substance brand and like, and I can just help those people. You know what I mean? So it's like, sometimes it's that thing that you've been doing because it's your passion and it drives you in the background. And then you're like, oh, like I could actually monetize this or pursue this as an actual career. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's really cool. So when you made that jump, did you immediately start uh, Music Meets the Boardroom or was there kind of like an evolution? I had started Music Meets the Boardroom about two or three years prior. Oh. So I had already been running Music Meets the Boardroom. I had no intentions of leaving my job. It was something I was going to do on the side. And um, next thing you know, it became this opportunity to build out this brand that that had roots um, and potential you know, areas of roots. So um, I've been pushing forward on that and I love it. And, and you know, I just... I had no clue. Like, I, I don't know, maybe your mind and, you know, subconsciously you're aware of what's going on, but I really didn't put the pieces together until <laughs> it was time. And I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> and I think it goes back to that conversation of if you feel this pull to do something, like you said, putting together a list of contacts and networks, you don't really think anything of it. You just do it because you feel like it's the right thing to do. And this is what I want to do. But then 
something happens later that connects the pieces for for us. And we're like, whoa, okay, this is why I needed to do this. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So was your, your mission with Music Meets the Boardroom always in relation to women and especially women of color? No, great question. When I started Music Meets the Boardroom, I really just started it. Um, and the reason why is because I had been helping and supporting artists for, for a long period of time, but it was just because I just loved doing it. And I had a mentor of mine who pulled me to the side one day. He was like, LaToya, you need to do something with this. Like, do you see the pattern here? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? You know? And once I got it in that conversation, it was two weeks later, I started Music Meets the Boardroom and I just started it for all artists, right? It was, a, a, I remember the first workshop that I held, it was just this beautiful collage of different types of artists from uh, videographers to classically trained violinists and, you know, producers. Like it was just amazing. And over the years, I started to kind of niche down a little bit more um, based on just uh, the more that I learned. And then also just watching the market and the industry and finding the areas and pockets that just were not served. And um, so that's how I ended up deciding, you know what, I want to, I want to, I want to work with not only women, not only women of color, but I want to make sure I focus on women um, such as myself that looks like me, who does not really have anything out there. Like I'm, one of few, if, if not mm. the only one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you know, I find it interesting because I've niched to, I started out niching to women, like just purely because that was the platform that I created. Right. And then I've kind of like opened it up to like more people, but then I've kind of narrowed it down a little bit more. And do you find that like, like you're attracting those people, but then you're attracting a lot of other people. And then they come to you and they're like, is it okay if I work with you? Cause I'm not a woman of color. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a white guy, you know, or something like that. Yes, I do have that. Um, but what I learned in my experience is that people are going to go where the good information is. They don't care. And that goes back to the conversation of, Hey, you know, I want in the room and you know what the, the most interesting thing is the conference, the music, um, the, Music Me Support Room sponsors a conference called the Indie Artist Power Conference every year. And um, we we emphasize through our marketing that, hey, this is a safe space for women of color, for black women. But let me tell you, it's a rainbow in that room. Everybody shows up and everybody's welcome at the end of the day. We want to just make sure that um, women of color, black women are heard. Right. And that we address those unique needs that we have that never get addressed. And so um, but everyone can learn from all the information shared. Yeah, I love what's great about niching down is you can speak specifically to specific pain points and problems, which is why I've always loved to talk to women in the industry, because there are very specific pain points of women that men do not experience. And right. I did not even know that you wrote this book, but when I saw it in your bio, I was like, oh my gosh, she wrote a book about women in the studio and like the certain experiences that they have that are really only mostly for women. So tell them a little bit about that book. Cause I, I had no idea that you had that book. And I think that's a great resource. Yes. It was, sounds like you not only found the book, but you read it too. <laughs> I didn't read it, but oh, okay. Well, it is, a, it is a super short read and I intentionally created that book for that, for that reason. I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's called Simple Methods, Smarter Decisions, a safety resource for female recording artists. And once again, just acknowledging and through just watching and research and seeing that there was no resources for women. There wasn't anything out there that really spoke to our needs, our unique needs as women in the industry. And I felt silly about the fact that as a woman, we get so used to maneuvering spaces and not thinking much about that, right? Mm. And it made me take a step back and I'm like, whoa, some of this stuff is not okay. Right. We, we need to talk about this. We need to be more open about the experiences that we have. We need to share more of these experiences with other women who are coming down the pipeline. And that is what that book is about. It's about um, not only providing useful information for those who are um, seeking a career in music. It's not only about reinforcing and empowering women who are already in music, but it's also um, an opportunity to encourage us as women to share our stories unapologetically for those that are coming after us. 
Yeah, I think it's a tricky subject, right? Because, you know, we don't want all the men out there, like there's plenty of men that are super supportive of women and we don't want them to think that we're making this blanket statement that like, oh, men are always doing this to women or, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, but there are these stories and we need to talk about them. Yes. And you know, what's so crazy? A lot of the people who read that book and gain value at the book are men. (laughs) I have a lot of men who reach out and they're like, I love this book. I've learned so much. And I'm like, oh, this is great. (laughs) So yeah, they read it too. I get it. It's like sensitivity training for them. Yes. um, And a lot of them are actually artists who Mm. are, because I think also, um, and this was, I had a realization after I wrote the book was that it's not only women who have certain type of experiences. Men deal with it too. It's just not as, you know, often as we know, socially acceptable to be more open about the experiences Mm. that men have. Right. And so I believe that's why um, a lot of men gravitate towards the book because they're like, whoa, you know what? Things happen to us too. Unique experiences that we need to be aware of. And I'm going to read this. Maybe I'll learn something from it. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. You know, with with the the Me Too movement and stuff, like it is a lot more okay for women to share those stories and maybe men feel like, "Oh, you know, this doesn't happen to any other men except me," you know, cuz th- it's not out there in the public as much. Right. Wow, that's really cool. Um okay, so what I would love to know since you've had so much experience as an entrepreneur, you know, what's one of the biggest lessons that you can share with people as an entrepreneur that could really be helpful to all of the creatives and artists out there that are listening. Cause you know, if you, even if you don't admit it, like you guys are entrepreneurs, right? You're running a business. Absolutely. That is completely true. I think that the most powerful and, um, the most valuable thing that I think we can do as artists, especially if we're starting out or if we're maybe stuck somewhere, we don't see the results that we want is getting really clear about who we serve as artists and what outcome we desire to produce as a result of what we're doing. Right. And getting clear about that and making sure that we're taking the right opportunities that are um, aligned with the path that we're trying to go. And I also think being, you know, as I mentioned, figuring out who you serve or who you want to connect with, who is your dream fan? I think that is so important. And I speak a lot about that on TikTok because it is really a huge part of our success. You know, everyone is not a fan. Everyone's not a fan, right? Um, And it goes back to the the question and conversation we're having about, hey, Latoya, you serve women, you serve women of color, but does everyone else kind of show up? Yes, they do. And and that happens to us as artists as well, right? We may like, we may prefer fans who um, have a love for green cars. And we talk to that fan, hey, I got this green car that rocks and rolls. I'm like, oh, but someone else may come along and be like, hey, I don't like green cars, but I want to know what's going on over here. There's like this big connection. And then next, you know, they're interested, you know? Mm. Um, And I think that is a a big thing that a lot of artists struggle with. But I also think part of it is the fear of investing to get the right help in relationship to those conversations, right? Because we can spend six months or six years trying to figure out this one thing, or we could work with someone like you or I who can help you figure it out in 15 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is the most important components there. I agree. I agree. And that's part of the, the, you know, as everyone knows, like part of being an entrepreneur is taking risk, right? And yes, investing yourself in, in yourself is a big risk and you need to do that in order to make any kind of progress. Yes. And, and being, being at peace around that, Mm -hmm. right. Being at peace around the fact that entrepreneurship requires risk. Entrepreneurship requires money. It requires vulnerability, responsibility, all of those things and, and more. Right. And, um, it's a very humbling process. It's a growing process. And I think it goes back to the conversation we were talking about earlier of entrepreneurship being this spiritual walk, you know, because you really have to like allow yourself to be really vulnerable in so many ways in order to even experience, um, the returns and, uh, the, the highs of entrepreneurship. Yep. Yeah, totally. Well, I did want to ask you just a little bit about TikTok because you've done so well on TikTok. 
Um, and I've only recently started on TikTok in like April of this year, right? I, I was like, my friend Katie like dragged me kicking and stream, screaming onto TikTok because I was like, this is not for me. I'm too old. I just turned 50. You know, like it doesn't make sense for me, but I actually really am enjoying it. Um, and I was curious because as you know, like I've been known for serving women, but when I look at my TikTok analytics, like most of my audience there is men. And so I'm not sure if it's just because in general, there are, is a higher percentage of men on TikTok. No, um, I think maybe I, I'm not quite sure if you call out your audience by name or have something that references them, but I do make an effort to do that. Um, you do do that. You're very clear. I'm very clear and people are feisty in those comments and that's okay because it goes back to the conversation of speaking to my target consumer, my audience, my fan unapologetically, unapologetically, right? But everyone else still comes and falls in love with the content. And then some people don't like it and that's okay, right? That means it's just not a space for you. Um, so I am very intentional about that. Uh, and I've learned a few things and I'm learning some things now. One is to stop when I just need a break from TikTok. Mm. Um, that's a little hard for me to do. I'm kind of having that moment now uh, and my numbers are reflecting that, right? I'm kind of, yeah, I, like, I need a break. And sometimes I'll stop uh, and I'll take a break for like a week or two. And you think like, okay, what's going to happen to my numbers or anything like that? Usually nothing. It just, you know, it's still gross, you know, because your old videos are still uh, turning. Right. Um, and I find I make better content when I take a break. So um, I'm kind of getting ready to, to do that maybe a week or something like that. Even though I'm coming up on this conference, I still think it's a healthy thing to do. Um, that is one valuable thing I've learned that people don't really talk about on TikTok that does make a difference. Um, and so um, one other thing that I did was I actually invested in, in my brand and in, in myself as a creator, as a entrepreneur to grow Music Me Support Room. And I hired people to help me learn how to show up on TikTok in different ways. If I'm struggling with anything related to different areas of TikTok, I will find a person who does that well and I will mm -hmm. hire them. I hire them and not only do I apply it and use it, I test it out and then I take it and I share it with my, my customers and my clients. So um, it's kind of like, you know, a, a double whammy there of benefits. But um, just recently I hired someone to help me with SEO, TikTok mm -hmm. SEO, because TikTok is really focused on YouTube. They want to dominate that space of educational content and they want to become the number one search engine, which they're actually not far away from that. Oh, gosh. Wow. Uh, right. With gener Generation Z, they are the number one search engine right now. And so this is a really great time if you have educational content to really push that out and make sure that SEO content is like lining up so that you can be found and maybe be like a TikTok educational star, you know? Mm. <laughs> And how do you, how do you feel like it is for musicians? I mean, I know that TikTok started as a music platform. Like I do think it's just a fantastic way for musicians to, to connect with fans and to, to break new music and stuff like that. Are you finding that with your clients? Yes. I think it's still a challenge with how to tackle that, you know, and finding, and I think part of it is being okay with your journey, my journey, our journeys being different you know, and we often use the model that we see from someone else versus being okay with saying, hey, that doesn't work for me, but this does. It looks different, but it works. And that's okay. And um, TikTok really is challenging us as artists to, to explore those options, right? And so um, artists that do take on that challenge and embrace it do very, very well on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen some really creative ways of promoting music on TikTok, which is which is fun. But like, I know some of us just feel like we don't have like all of our I've always felt this way, like all my creativity goes into music. Like I'm not I don't I'm not crafty. I don't design anything like I'm not artistic, <laughs> you know, so sometimes I'm like uh, all my creativity has been completely tapped in in writing music or whatever. And so, you know, we feel like we just don't know what to do. Right. And you know what? You bring up a really great point with that. And um, once again, a humbling moment was when I realized that 
oftentimes we're creatives, right? We are creatives, but we, I don't know, and maybe you have explored this, but are we afraid to, to take that creativity out of music and apply it across other areas of our lives and businesses? Or are we, why is that? Because entrepreneurship requires creativity. Yep. Why is it difficult for us to kind of like not be tunnel vision, right? You know, so. I don't know. And I think, <laughs> I, I think finding the right inspiration, like for me, what TikTok has done is it's, it's like, inspired me to get creative about content, like in a way that I wasn't before. And that's actually allowed my Instagram to blow up because I'm creating much more interesting content because I'm having fun with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's just finding that thing that's going to, going to pull that creativity out of you or spark it or be like the right platform or the right medium for you. You know, I tried to do YouTube and I'm just like, I don't like this format for whatever reason, you know? Yes. Yes. I struggled with YouTube as well. Um, even though I knew like I should be speaking and sharing information and breaking things down for some reason, I, it just didn't mesh. Um, but TikTok work, I think it was the short bites and then I can, you yes. know, kind of do whatever kind of, and it's, yeah, component. YouTube feels too regimented for me. Like you got to right. do it in this order and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, I'm a person that just likes to go live and talk, you know, or do, you know, just get on the mic and record a podcast like we are right now. And I'm like, I don't want someone to tell me that I have to do it in this order and these rules. And, and that's where I think TikTok was freeing. Right. That that's definitely the artist in us. We need, mm -hmm. we need all those borders off of us in order to actually thrive. <laughs> <So> yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, I would love to hear what you think about, you know, now that we're kind of coming out of the pandemic a little bit and things are coming back and, um, you know, where do you think the music industry is going? Like, what do you think the whole pandemic period like has done? How has it shifted the music industry and where do you think we're kind of headed? I think there is still space to color and shape music right now. I think it's a very wonderful place to be. You know, a, a lot of people may be afraid or like, I don't understand what's happening. I love that. I mm. think that creates a world of opportunity because that means that you can come in and create what you want right now. And I love it. I love it. We have the ability to shape what music is going to look like tomorrow. And I'm here for it. Um, yeah, that's what I got to say about it. <laughs> I, I think I, I think there's so much that's affecting it, but even it's almost like we, we, we're coming out of the pan, kind of coming out of the pandemic. And then, you know, they're saying we're going, walking into recession. And here's the crazy part. When I heard that, I heard opportunity. Like mm -hmm. I didn't hear anything bad. I was like, yeah, like this is the opera. We got another chance to go in here and, you know, shape it up again. And I think so, you know, we just have to get a little more creative about what that looks like for ourselves and show up and get it done. Yeah, I think I think that's one thing that I really embraced during the pandemic was like, this is opportunity. Mm -hmm. And this is like a, a kick in the butt, really, to like get out of my comfort zone and do something different. And I saw that in a lot of musicians as well. And I think now, you know, we can like, yeah, we can go back to doing some performances, but we also don't have to put up with things that we don't want to anymore because we've right. seen alternative ways to, of do, doing things during the pandemic. Absolutely. I also think that the space for independent artists is going to improve. It's going to get bigger. There's going to be more opportunity around it. I wouldn't be surprised if I start to see more major artists go independent. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's coming. Um, and so this is the season to, if you're an independent artist, man, you can create any type of opportunity for yourself that you want to create really. Yeah. And I think that the pandemic also reminded us how valuable art is, how valuable, you know, the connection of, of creativity, of creativeness, and instead of us just sitting alone in our homes, you know, like, and, and those experiences of music, how those, how we need those in order to like, you know, for our mental health and things like that. And so, you know, musicians like remember that the world has remembered again, how valuable you are. We, this is our time to take advantage of that. I agree. And I think also that we need more, even more music right now. I feel like this is the time to flood the airways, to flood the internet with music, 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 because, you know, as we know, music heals, 
Music softens our heart. Music allows us to cry and get all that out, you know, that we need. And people are experiencing so much right now that's so heavy on all of us. And so we really need the arts as much as possible right now, for sure. Yep. Agreed. Well, on that note, I'd love to have you tell everybody about your upcoming conference. I am a huge fan of conferences and I've, I've done the Profitable Musician Summit 2018, 2019, 2020, like looking at doing something probably in the beginning of 2023. I think they're so valuable and there's so many, you can learn so many different things at these conferences and it get exposed to so many perspectives. And what I love about yours is I'm seeing people there that I don't see at every single summit that people put on, you know? So give us an idea of who people are gonna experience at your conference. Absolutely. That is actually part of my mission with the conference is to bring in people that we don't see in other places. And I even like to bring in people who are not necessarily in music, but Mm. have a particular expertise that we can use as artists. Um, my particular conference or our particular conference is focused around building brand, building business and helping artists shift, not only as being confident as artists, but being confident as business owners. Right. And I like to take the artists a little, a step, a little bit of a step further, right? Not only seeing ourselves as entrepreneurs, but I want to see more artists see themselves as CEOs. Mm -hmm. We have very few artists that actually move in that realm. And it is reflected within our industry. Artists who see themselves as entrepreneurs and treat their brand and build a brand around their art tend to be extremely successful. This is where we see the Jessica Simpsons, we see the Rihannas, and we don't see enough of those, right? There's so much opportunity around that. And yet we hear these stories of how so many artists work so hard, they get older, they're having to sell their catalogs, they're having to do these other things because they did not build more around that that opportunity of music. You know, it's so interesting because I have had this experience too, where I like, I have this deep desire for artists to be CEOs. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like playing with my mission statement one time. And I was like, you know, I put the, the word CEO in there and I put it out in my Facebook group. And I'm like, what do you guys think of this mission? And they're like, yeah, I don't really resonate with being a CEO. Like I got so much of that response. And I was like, oh, we got a little more education. We got to move them toward this a little bit more before we can tell them that this is my mission because they're not there yet. So Mm -hmm. what do you think it is about that term CEO that like freaks artists out? (laughs) I think the concept of it is like, it takes away the opportunity to be creative. Mm. Um, it takes us, it feels like it's taking us away. Exactly. The opposite of what we want to be. And I totally agree with you. And one thing that I did was I started to kind of, instead of like leading with that, because at one point I was like CEO, be an artist, a CEO. And I decided to kind of slightly, I'm not going to say bury it, but still have it there. Like that's the best way I can describe it. Like it's, the, the information we share, the method that I teach and share is still very much in line with that, but I don't necessarily lead with those words anymore. Um, like, you know, you kind of tested. Instead, I focus on just the um, skill sets of building that. And so people don't really know that that's what they're building, but that's really what it is. And so it'll come together later. Yeah, it's the whole thing where you're like, you've got the like delicious looking pizza, but then like under the cheese layer, there's some veggies that you're hiding in there, right? Exactly. And it goes back to entrepreneurship. This is a great point and probably very valuable to your listeners is that, uh, let me find the right words. You may know it. You give people what they want. I mean, no, no, you give them what they need, but you sell them what they want. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And, and, And I think that I think they'll get there, you know, because when I started the female entrepreneur musician podcast in 2015, people weren't resonating with being entrepreneurs as musicians back then. Now I truly believe that they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that evolution has happened and enough artists, especially getting out there on TikTok are talking about things more around being the CEO and like the, the holistic business approach and stuff. I think, you know, we may have this conversation again in another five years and it'll be like, oh yeah, artists are CEOs, badass CEOs. You know what I mean? So I think it's an evolution. I totally agree with you. And I love it when I see artists asking questions, 
you know, talking about their experiences with their music, their songs, protecting their art um, and, and just being okay with the process of that. And I love it. I love it so much. Well, tell them how they can get some information on the conference and sign up and, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, people are they going to, what kind of subjects are they going to see at the conference? Absolutely. So um, artists and even, you know, entrepreneurs in general, can, anyone can attend, um, can go to musicmeetstheboardroom.com or you can go to um, IndieArtistPowerConference.com. It all routes to the same place. And we have four, it's a two-day conference and we have four speakers on the first day, which is the 17th of September. You are going to hear from a music monetization expert. You're going to hear the story of stolen art and, and the methods that this particular artist took to um, attempt to get her music back and credit for her music. You're also going to hear from a um, artist who is a very big popular artist, um, was very, like super famous back in like 19, the early, like the mid or late nineties. And so she's going to talk about her experience with fame and what that is really and what to expect. Because oftentimes, oh, you know, a lot of artists want to be famous and then they become famous and they're like, I want out of this, and but, we don't, <laughs> but they never really break it down. And she's going to come in and she's going to break that down for us. We also have um, someone who's on day two going to come in and teach us how to have a more balanced life as artists, because we don't necessarily sometimes until we get to the point where we realize this, that our health is our wealth. And we need to keep ourselves healthy. Um, I, I decided to bring someone in after I had had a relapse with MS. I didn't know I had MS, but mm. I was working so hard that I had a relapse. And I said, oh, no, this I, I, I do not want to promote this. Right. I want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And so we're going to bring someone else to do that. Um, publishing as well. Someone who um, is very knowledgeable about music publishing, um, pitching um, sorry, pitching shows to different TV networks, sync licensing. And let me talk a little bit about sync licensing. We have a lot of events that talk about sync licensing, but what I learned throughout um, my research is that there's not enough people from communities of color in general who actually submit their music for consideration. Mm -hmm. And a lot of sync licensing supervisors are literally begging for people of color to submit their music. They want to, they want to consider them for whatever reason. Like let's say for example, you have a movie who has a special scene representing indigenous, the indigenous community. And you may want some music that excuse me, you may want some music that represents the indigenous community, but if you don't have anything, what do you, you got now go searching, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is part of uh, the conversation we're going to have and encouraging uh, more women and, and people of, uh, in communities of different color, different communities of different color, <laughs> communities of color to, I get excited and I start talking fast, <laughs> communities of color to submit their music and how that works, what that process looks like and uh, how they can win in that process. Love it. I love that. And, and I, and I think that's, that's probably true that there aren't enough people submitting the kinds of music that they are truly looking for. And, you know, this is vicious cycle, right? Cause then it's, they're like, well, you know, it would be too hard for us to go find it. So we just find from stuff we have, but we really want to feature this. So I think right. that's, that's really good. Awesome. Awesome. So music meets the boardroom. Just go to that website, you guys, um, and grab your ticket to the conference. Um, and how can they connect with you on all the socials? Yes. So my primary social is TikTok, Latoya, the songstress over on TikTok. My secondary is YouTube shorts. So um, music meets the boardroom on, on there. So I don't really spend a lot of time on Instagram anymore. Um, I do maintain the business page there, but nothing personal on, on Instagram at this moment. <laughs> Got it. Well, she's very active on TikTok. So Go check her out on TikTok. Thank you so much, Latoya. This has been so great. I've loved getting to know your journey and, you know, all the experience that you have. And we have so much in common the way that we really look at music and entrepreneurship. Absolutely. You are very wise. And thank you for um, this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. Awesome. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. 
leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 